This lecture is part of a series of lectures on modular forms and would be about the discriminant function. So the discriminant function, usually denoted by delta, is e4 cubed minus e6 squared, where e4 and e6 are the Eisenstein series, except you divide this by 1728. And the reason for this is that this makes the Fourier expansion of it start with a leading coefficient of 1. Um, and we recall that delta of tau was non-zero for tau in the upper half plane. Um, what we're going to show this lecture is there's another expression for delta, which is that delta of tau is equal to q times the product of 1 minus q to the n to the 24. And you notice that um, this number 24 is a sort, of, a sort of magic number that keeps on appearing in the theory of modular forms. Um, incidentally, the, the, this infinite product sort of explains why the discriminant function is non-zero, because this infinite product converges to a non-zero number in the entire upper half plane. Um, the, the discriminant function is very closely related to the um, Eisenstein series E2 of tau. So you remember we worked out the Fourier expansion of the Eisenstein series E4, E6 and so on, and if we apply this to for, for 2 we formally get that this is equal to 1 minus 24 times sum of sigma 1n times q to the n. However, this is not a modular form for reasons I'll explain in, in a moment. And the reason this is related to the delta function is if you take the logarithm of delta of tau, this is equal to the logarithm of q minus sum over m and n, I guess there should be a factor of 24 there, times q to the m n over m. And if you differentiate this with respect to tau, we get 2 pi i minus 2 pi i times 24 times sum of sigma 1 n q to the n. So you remember that d by d tau of q to the n is 2 pi i n times q to the n. And we see that this is just 2 pi i times e2 of tau. Um, so we have this fundamental relation between the discriminant and e2 that the, deriv the logarithmic derivative of the discriminant function is equal to 2 pi i times e2 of tau. Um, that's assuming the product formula for the delta function, which we're going to prove later on. But for the moment, let's just assume this and have a look at some consequences of this. So first of all, we notice that um, since delta is a modular form, delta of minus 1 over tau is equal to tau to the 12 times delta of tau. Um, and from this, we can get a functional equation for e2, and we find that e2 of minus 1 over tau is equal to tau squared e2 of tau um, plus 6 tau over pi i. And we notice this makes e2 almost into a modular form. So if this were correct, then e2 would be a modular form of weight 2. But um, it isn't a modular form of weight 2 because there aren't any. And this is a, this is a sort of correction factor. Um, so so it, it just sort of fails to be a modular form by, by this sort of elementary factor here. Um, actually, we can sort of get rid of this if, if we notice that um, um, if we take 1 over the imaginary part of minus 1 over tau, um, this is equal to 1 over the imaginary part of tau times tau squared minus 2i tau. And you notice this means... Um, the imaginary part, one over the imaginary part of tau also behaves like a modular form of weight 2 with a similar fudge factor correcting it. So what this means is if you take e2 of tau and you subtract 3 over pi times the imaginary part of tau, this is a modular form of weight 2. 
because the fudge factor here cancels out with the fudge factor here. Um, the trouble is this is not holomorphic um, because of this factor one over the imaginary part of tau. So, so we sort of have a choice of evils. We can either have a function that is holomorphic but is not quite a modular form of weight two, or we can have a function that's a modular form of weight two but is not quite holomorphic and we, we sort of can't, we can't get both properties at once. Um, so these sorts of modular forms are sometimes called almost holomorphic or nearly holomorphic and that means they're, they're sort of holomorphic except you're allowed factors of one over the imaginary part of tau. There's also something else called weakly holomorphic which means it's holomorphic on the upper half plane but is allowed to have poles at I infinity and I can never remember which is weakly holomorphic and which is almost holomorphic so I don't really like either of these terms. Um, well, now we should explain why E2 of tau is not quite a modular form. So, so why is E2 not modular? Well, um, um, if we look at the proof that E4, E6 and so on are modular, we're looking at a sum of 1 over um, m plus n tau to the k where k is equal to 2, 4, 6 and so on. So we're sort of summing over all values of m plus n tau so we get 0, 1, 2, minus 1, minus 2 and then we might get tau, 2 tau, sorry tau plus 1, tau plus 2, 2 tau and minus tau and so on. So we're summing over all these points and in order to work out the Fourier expansion what we did was we we, we, we summed over the rows. Well, we, we, we don't sum over zero, but we sum over all the rows. Um, we sum each row and then, th th then we, 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 we sum all the rows together. And, and if we do that, we get the Fourier series for EK. Um, in order to work out the functional equation, prove the function that it's a modular form, what you end up doing is you first sum over all these columns and then add up the sums of the columns. So the, the, the sum over rows being equal to the sum over the columns corresponds to the fact that um, ek of minus 1 over tau is equal to tau to the k ek of tau. Now for k greater than or equal to 4 this holds by absolute convergence. However, if k is equal to 2, then this series is no longer absolutely convergent and we actually get a slightly different answer if we first sum over rows or if we first sum over columns. So this is a rare case when there are two natural ways of summing a series and they give different answers depending on the order of the terms. Um, um, however, the series for E2, although it doesn't converge absolutely, it only just fails. If, if we sort of replace this exponent k equals 2 by anything bigger than 2, you know, 2 plus a millionth, then the series would be absolutely convergent. And when something is just on the borderline of not being convergent, you can sort of usually um, get something out of it by pushing a little bit harder. And that, that's what we can do with E2. Um, so you remember the, 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 the functional equation for E2 is sort of equivalent to the fact that delta is a modular form. Um, in practice, instead of using delta, it's easier to use its 24th root, which is usually called the Dedekind eta function. So um, eta to the 24 equals delta, and the eta function of tau is just q to the 1 over 24 times the product of n greater than 0 of 1 minus q to the n. And its function equation is eta of minus 1 over tau is equal to the square root of tau over i times eta of tau. You have to be a bit careful about sine of the square root. Um, and in order to prove this, what, um, th this function equation, um, what we want to do is to prove that log of eta of i over y minus log of eta of i y is equal to a half 
log of y. Here we're just going to put tau equals i y and take y to be real, um, just so that we don't have to think about. Um, we're just taking tau on the imaginary axis because that's a little bit easier to think about. So, so we want to prove this functional equation, which is equivalent to the functional equation for e2 and to the um, function equation of delta. And if we expand this out, we find we've got to prove the sum of m greater than or equal to 1 of 1 over m times 1 over 1 minus e to the 2 pi my is equal to sum of m greater than or equal to 1 of 1 over m times 1 over 1 minus e to the 2 pi m over y plus pi over 12 times y minus 1 over y minus log y over 2. So this is coming from the eta to the 1 over 24 and these two terms are coming from log of eta. Um, and one of these sort of comes from summing over the rows and one of these terms sort of comes from summing over the columns of E2. And um, what we're going to do is we recall that there's a way of summing series in complex analysis by using the fact that pi over tan of pi z has poles um, of residue 1 at z um, equals minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, 2, and so on. So we find that the, the sum over n of f of n is something to do with 1 over 2 pi i times the integral over some contour of f of z times pi over tan pi z dz. Here c is going to be a contour um, including um, all the values of n for n less than some bound and um, the value of this is going to be this sum here plus some other terms coming from other residues of this. So you remember in complex analysis this is a sort of standard way of summing series and what we're going to do is to apply it to try and sum this series here. And what we'll do is we will find that we get an expression like this. Um, so um, let's try this. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to take the function 1 over z times 1 over tan pi z times 1 over tan pi z over y. And let's take a look at where its poles and zeros are. So first of all, it's, it's got a big pole at zero because it's, it's got a pole of order three at zero. And then it's also got poles at y, 2y, minus y, minus 2y. And it's also got poles at i, 2i, 3i, and so on. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to take a big contour that sort of encloses um, lots of the poles like this. And now let's look at what, what the residues of all the poles are. So we've got this tan pi over z and if we add up the residues on the, on the real axis, um, the sum of the residues here um, corresponds to um, log of eta of i y um, now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to put a constant in. The reason I'm not going to evaluate all these constants explicitly is most of the audience will, will, will sort of not pay attention to them and more seriously some of the audience will pay attention to them and will write all these little polite comments afterwards telling me all the errors I've made. So I'm going to outmaneuver these people by not actually telling you what these constants are. Um, so here we get um, the residues um, correspond to the terms for log of eta of i over y um, times some constant. And that's not quite correct because what I should also do is add some constant not depending on y and we also have minus some constant not depending on y. Unfortunately these two constants are actually the same. So, um, so that the residues on the real and imaginary axis sort of correspond to these two terms in the functional equation.
Then we have a residue at zero and the residue at zero turns out to be the term 1 over y minus 1 over y again times some constant that I'm not going to worry too much about. Um, and now we've got a problem. So normally um, you, you would like the integral over this contour to tend to zero. So, so, so let's sort of take this distance to be r and this distance to be y times r. And you would like this to tend to zero if r tends to infinity. And it doesn't. Um, if you try estimating it, these bits are sort of bounded as r tends to infinity, and this is constant times 1 over r, and the length of the path is proportional to r, so it just fails to um, tend to zero. Um, in fact, it definitely doesn't tend to zero. Um, so how do we find the limit over, over this contour that, that, that goes round all these, all these poles? Well, what we do is we notice that tan of pi z is usually approximately i or minus i in the upper half or lower half plane. And similarly, this is. So um, these terms here are going to be approximately um, plus 1 in this quadrant, minus 1 in this quadrant, minus 1 in this quadrant, and plus 1 in this quadrant. Now that means that when you integrate this thing here, so one, the integral of 1 over z times 1 over tan of pi z times 1 over tan of pi z over y dz, um, will be approximately the integral of 1 over z times plus or minus 1 dz. Um, except this isn't a holomorphic function because it's plus 1 in some quadrants and minus 1 in other quadrants. So you, you can't sort of say the integral is going to be the residue of this because it's, it's just not holomorphic anywhere. But what you can do is, this is such an easy function to integrate, you can just integrate it explicitly using 1a calculus more or less. You know, the integral of 1 over z is just um, log, of, log of z. So what you find is that you get a constant times log of y as the limit as r tends to infinity. So to summarise, um, um, the, the residues on the um, axes give you um, these two terms here, the sums um, giving you eta of i y and eta of i over y. The residue at zero gives you this term here involving a y and a 1 over y. And the limit of the integral around the contour gives you this log term here. So that proves this functional equation, which as I said is um, equivalent to the proof that the um, discriminant can be written as an infinite product and is also equivalent to the fact that um, the Eisenstein series E2 um, is almost a modular form. And uh, I guess for those of you who want an exercise, you can go and figure out what all these constants that I've been too lazy to evaluate are.